Hi guys, Dane here, and today I'm going to be doing a quick review of The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. So, this is number three in the Chronicles of Narnia series, if you go, uh, cro uh, like, chronologically through the series, rather than in publication date, or at least that's what I understand. I picked up uh, all seven of them in a box set, so I've been reading them through in, in that order. And uh, I'll give, give you the blurb before I give you my comments on this. A wild gallop for freedom. On a desperate journey, two runaways meet and join forces. Though they are only looking to escape their harsh lives, they soon find themselves at the centre of a terrible battle. It is a battle that will decide their fate and the fate of Narnia itself. So, this was very, very boring. That was basically my problem with it. Uh, I've seen reviewers also have said that it's racist. I don't think it is racist. I think it was just ill-advised and, you know, a product of its times. Um, but really, it's just a very dull story about a boy who makes friends with a talking horse and then they go on a long journey and then we steal the plot from um, The Prince and the Pauper by Mark Twain for a little bit and then there's a big battle and then it's the end and they're just not very interesting characters uh, the characters of like Peter and Edmund and Susan and all those lot they're in it but while they're being kings and queens which means that their dialogue is just like super formal and boring. And we have a lot of this like just paragraphs long old legends and stuff that just totally wasn't interesting. I think the, the reason the first two books in the Narnia series worked well was because they were... This, this is the same reason why I think that Philip Pullman's His Dark Materials trilogy works well and La Belle Sauvage did not, which is that... The, like, the original three books in that trilogy and the first two books that I've read in this series were adventure stories first and then afterwards they thought, you know, the whatever they wanted to communicate, whether it's, you know, religious themes or, you know, in this case there's again a lot of lore of Narnia. It's almost like how Tolkien had the Silmarillion which had all the lore in it. And, uh... But it's, it's like it's put that first and foremost at the expense of telling a good story. I'm going to go through though and have a look at some of, some of like my tabs. We do also have some illustrations. I should also mention I don't like talking animals. So I don't know what I'm doing reading Narnia in the first place to be honest. Uh, we also have, so we have right at the beginning, we have Shasta as our main, main character. And uh, the horse, so this is the boy and the horse is called uh, Brihi Hini Brini Huiha. And Shasta says, I'll never be able to say that. Can I call you Bree? The horse says to Shasta as well, I suppose like all humans, you only eat natural food like grass and oats. We have this little exchange where they make a few friends on their journeys. Why, it's only a girl, he exclaimed. And what business is it of yours if I am only a girl, snapped the stranger. You're probably only a boy, a rude common little boy, a slave probably who's stolen his master's horse. Well, at least she gave as good as she got. And we have one of the chapters, A Wayside Adventurer, ends with this little paragraph I want to read. Aravis immediately began, sitting quite still and using a rather different tone and style from her usual one. For in Calomen, storytelling, whether the stories are true or made up, is a thing you're taught, just as English boys and girls are taught essay writing. The difference is that people want to hear the stories, whereas I never heard of anyone who wanted to read the essays. So C.S. Lewis has never heard of anybody reading any collection of essays ever, apparently. And I thought he was literate. We have this kind of ironic bit here, where they start talking, and basically C.S. Lewis has this point of like, you know, when you're hanging out with a group of friends and then suddenly two of them or three of them start talking about something that you weren't at, you feel kind of excluded, or if they have in-jokes and that kind of thing. But the problem is, is that this entire book feels like that. You know, where like you're listening to people talking and you have no idea what they're talking about. And so it's kind of accidentally ironic. I'm going to read you this long paragraph. Bear with me with the terrible pronunciation. As I say, I, I basically have no idea what he's talking about. Next day, all four of them, two horses and two humans, continued their journey together. Shasta thought it had been much pleasanter, shouldn't it be more pleasant, when he and Bree were on their own. For now it was Bree and Aravis who did nearly all the talking. Bree had lived a long time in Calamen, and had always been among Tarkans and Tarkans' horses, and so of course he knew a great many of the same people and places that Aravis knew. She would always be saying things like, But if you were at the fight of Zulindre, you would have seen my cousin Alamash. And Bree would answer, Oh yes, Alamash, he was only captain of the chariots, you know. I don't quite hold with chariots or the kind of horses who draw chariots. That's not real cavalry. But he is a worthy nobleman. He filled my nosebag with sugar after the taking of Tebeth. 
Or else Bree would say, I was down at the lake of Mesriel that summer. And Aravis would say, oh, Mesriel, I had a friend there. Lazaraline Tarkina, what a delightful place it is. Those gardens in the Valley of the Thousand Perfumes. Bree was not in the least trying to leave Shasta out of things, though Shasta sometimes nearly thought he was. People who know a lot of the same things can hardly help talking about them, and if you're there, you can hardly help feeling that you're out of it. But yeah, there is a lot of that throughout this as well, of just like endless paragraphs with these like made up proper nouns, so you just don't know what's going on. Like, I could probably make some of that up now. Like, oh, last weekend I went on an adventure to Thuringau and saw the mighty Hakim and the way that they stand next to the Shamlamlams. And you're just like, oh, please. Please stop. You get it in a lot in sci-fi as well, actually. We do have this little nod to the Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe. He was, in fact, a fawn, which is a creature Shasta had never seen a picture of or even heard of. And if you've read a book called The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, you may like to know that this was the very same fawn, Tumnus by name, whom Queen Susan's sister Lucy had met on the very first day when she found her way into Narnia. But he was a good deal older now, for by this time Peter and Susan and Edmund and Lucy had been kings and queens of Narnia for several years. But it's like you only have maybe a few little bits throughout the book where it ties back into the rest of the series. I think maybe Susan, somebody's trying to marry Susan or something. This bit here I guess is a little bit of observation. There was also a little flagon of the sort of wine that is called white. Though it is really yellow. I did quite like that. That is true. White wine is yellow. We learn that uh, Shasta had never seen his own face in uh, The Looking Glass. Which actually, again, that kind of feeds into this Prince and the Pauper ripoff where, you know, Shasta discovers he's basically an identical twin of a prince. And here we have a moment where Shasta, who is already unlikable, becomes more unlikable. I'll never do anything nasty to a cat again as long as I live, said Shasta, half to the cat and half to himself. I did once, you know. I threw stones at a half-starved mangy old stray. What a dick. Who does that? I, I never understand people who would do that. Like, my instinct would be like, feed the cat like see if it needs medical attention and we have this quote here which kind of dates it as well for it is well known that women are as changeable as weathercocks and this only takes me up to page 94 of about 176 and after this point i didn't add any more flags because there literally wasn't anything worth flagging in fact i was gonna not bother even reviewing this because i didn't really have much to say about it i gave this a two out of five it was terrible it made me want to put the rest of the Narnia books into like my sort of bedside table reading. And then last night I started reading Prince Caspian. And while I'm not like, I'm not like specifically enjoying it, I've, I've not found it to be outright bad yet. So I've, I've moved it back into my main reading. But uh, yeah, I don't know. Not recommended for me, unfortunately. So there we have it, that's what I thought of The Horse and His Boy by C.S. Lewis. As always, don't forget to let me know in the comments what you thought of this book, if you've read it. Hit that like button if you've enjoyed this video, hit subscribe for more, and I will see you soon for another bookish video. Thanks a lot, bye bye